On the night and early morning of Saturday and Sunday, the 3rd and 4th of February 1973, 50 years tonight, six local New Lodge men were shot dead in the New Lodge area and one local man, Charlie Carson, was gravely wounded. Two of these men, Jim Sloan and Jim McCann, were killed in a drive-by shooting at Lynch's Bar, which stood close to where we gather tonight. They would be the first to die that night. Jim Sloan and his close friend Jim McCann had been socialising in Lynch's bar which stood at this location. At approximately 11.45pm, the two Jims left Lynch's bar. As they stood at the entrance of the bar talking to friends, a dark coloured Morris car drove up the New Lodge Road in their direction. The car was driving very slowly as it turned left onto the Antrim Road. As it drew level to both men, the backseat passenger in the Morris car who was identified as being in his 30s, clean shaven and having a military style haircut with no attempt to hide his identity, opened fire with a 9mm Sterling submachine gun hitting them both. Eyewitnesses said the car seemed low to the ground as though it was heavily armoured and resembled military vehicles of the time used in British military operations. The car turned left onto the Antrim Road and as it drew level with the Wei Ping Chinese restaurant, the occupants of the car fired indiscriminately into the restaurant, injuring two customers. The car then proceeded down the Antrim Road, doing a U-turn at the bottom of Cunard Street, in full view of the British Army Sanger at the front of Girdwood Military Barks. The car then proceeded back towards the New Lodge and the Chinese restaurant, passing a British Army Saracen that had responded to reports of the shooting at Lynch's Bar a few minutes earlier. The car was allowed to escape unchallenged. Residents who witnessed the shootings of Jim Sloan and Jim McCann alerted the British Army personnel that the car had been involved in the shooting. They refused to give chase and in turn threatened local residents. It is now widely accepted that the passengers of the Morris car were in fact members of a British Army undercover unit, the Military Reconnaissance Force. The shooting of Jim McCann and Jim Sloan has an uncanny resemblance to the June 1972 killing of three men on the Glen Road in West Belfast who were gunned down by a passing unmarked car. Two British soldiers in plain clothes were subsequently arrested and charged but released. Both Jim McCann and Jim Sloan would die from the injuries they received that night. Jim Sloan was 19 years old and Jim McCann was 18. Within minutes of the drive-by shooting of Jim Sloan and Jim McCann, the British forces opened fire on the junction of the New Lodge Road and Eddingham Street from both the direction of Duncan Gardens and the Copperfield Street in the Loyalist Tigers Bay. They also shot from the British military observation posts on top of the flats on the New Lodge Road. Tony T.C. Campbell, Brendan Fat McGuire, John Lochran and Ambrose Hardy were killed in these attacks, while Charlie Carson was severely wounded. TC was murdered on his way home after a night out celebrating his 19th birthday in Newington Youth Club's disco. On leaving the disco around 11pm, he walked with friends and family back down the New Lodge Road, heading towards the junction of Edlingham Street. TC and those with him heard the burst of gunfire, which would take the lives of Jim McCann and Jim Sloan, not far from where TC was standing. On hearing the shooting, TC made his way towards the Circle Club on the New Lodge Road and the junction of Eddingham Street at this location. Eyewitnesses state that there was considerable pandemonium and panic among local people who were on the street following the shooting outside Lynch's bar. Local people say that TC began to usher people to stay indoors out of harm's way and he was clearly concerned about the safety of others. It was at this stage the British Army, without warning, opened fire from a sandbag emplacement located at Dunkern Gardens and Copperfield Street in the Loyalist Tigers Bay area. An older couple, on hearing the gunfire, were in fear as they tried to get into their home on the opposite side of Eddingham Street from where TC was. Despite the pleas of his friends and local residents for him to stay in cover, TC ran across to assist the elderly couple. He succeeded in helping to get the elderly couple into their home safely. As he attempted to rejoin his friends on the opposite side of Edlingham Street, TC was gunned down. The only gunfire at this time was coming from the direction of the British Army sandbag emplacement on the Dunkern Garden side of Edlingham Street. 
Although wounded, TC attempted to crawl to safety, but as soon as he moved, he was a target for further gunfire. TC would bleed to death after receiving 17 bullet wounds to his body. He had just turned 19 years old on the day that he was murdered. Brendan Fat McGuire was born on the 24th of November 1940. On the night of Saturday the 3rd of February 1973, Brendan was socialising in the Circle Club, located where you stand today. At around 11.45pm, shooting was heard on the New Lodge Road by those in the club. Brendan and others left the club to see what had happened and where the shooting was coming from. When Brendan, along with other local residents, got out onto the street, they witnessed a young man who at this stage, not knowing it to be 19-year-old TC Campbell, lying wounded in Edenham Street. Brendan and local man Malachy Cunningham went to assist TC, despite the British Army continuing to fire down Edenham Street in the direction of the New Lodge Road. During a lull in the shooting, Brendan and Malachy ran across Edingham Street towards TC Campbell. This was around 11.50 or 11.55 p.m. As Brendan McGuire knelt beside TC, a further burst of gunfire came up Edingham Street from the British Army. Brendan shouted that he was hit and slumped over the body of TC Campbell, who was still alive at this stage. The shooting continued as local man Malachy Cunningham started to crawl back from Edingham Street. Notwithstanding his lucky escape, Malachy and local man Charlie Carson went back out to Edingham Street and recovered Brendan's body. Brendan McGuire was brought to Mrs Minnie Lochran's house at 171 New Lodge Road. At this stage, local man John Lochran had joined Malachy and Charlie in retrieving Brendan McGuire from Edingham Street. Brendan McGuire died from his injuries. He lost his life at the age of 32 while trying to assist the injured T.C. Campbell. John Lochran was born July 18th, 1938. He lived with his wife Anne and three children, and Anne was expecting her fourth child. On the evening of Saturday the 3rd of February 1973, John was at home with Anne. He had been working in Irvinstown, County Fermanagh, and would come home on a Friday due to Anne expecting her baby. John's mother, Minnie, who lived next door at 171 New Lodge Road, was alerted by shooting on the New Lodge Road and phoned an ambulance as soon as someone had been shot. Mrs Lochran then went next door to her son John's house and asked him to come quick as there was a man shot and he needed help. John put his boots on and went to the aid of the injured man. Unknown to John, the injured man he went out to assist was Brendan McGuire. John, Charlie Carson and Malachy Cunningham were attempting to recover Brendan from Edlingham Street and after succeeding they brought him to his mother's house. John Lochran would go out one last time to recover the badly injured TC Campbell. Before leaving the house, John's wife Anne pleaded with him in a poignant exchange not to go out, but on hearing TC's call for help, John could not ignore his calls for assistance. John and Charlie Carson attempted to drag young TC from the corner, with John lying on his stomach, grabbing the hold of TC, while Charlie would drag John back holding his ankles. Another burst of gunfire was directed at John, TC and Charlie. John Lochran was shot in the head and Charlie would be seriously injured. On hearing the shooting, John's mother Minnie ran to him on Edingham Street where she would witness the carnage. John Lochran was already dead. The injured Charlie Carson would be pulled from Edingham Street and brought to Mrs Lochran's house where he would be transported to hospital but only after the ambulance sent to pick up the dead and wounded would come under fire from the British Army. On two occasions, the ambulance sent would have to retreat from carrying out their duties. John Lochran was 35 at the time of his death. Ambrose Hardy lived at 22 Hillman Street with his father George and mother Violet. In the early hours of Sunday, the 4th of February, at approximately 1am, Ambrose, like others, was unable to get out of the Circle Club due to the intensity of the shooting by the British Army, which had already resulted in five local men being shot dead. Ambrose was eager to get home to his mother, as he knew that she would be worried about his safety due to the ongoing gunfire, and his main concern was alleviating her fears. He also voiced his concern that his mother would leave the house to go look for him. With this in mind, Ambrose asked those remaining in the Circle Club, did they have a handkerchief, a white handkerchief? 
Local woman, Lily McCauley, offered him a paper handkerchief. Lily asked what did he need a white hanky for. Ambrose stated that he wanted to go out onto the New Lodge Road and needed something to wave so that he didn't get shot. Lily offered Ambrose her white underskirt. He went to the front door of the Circle Club, opened the door, put his arm out and waved the underskirt towards the British Army post on top of the flats. He repeated this action a second time and then put his head out, but he fell back into the hallway of the Circle Club, dead. Ambrose was shot by a single high velocity bullet fired by a member of the British Army from the permanent military observation post on top of the flats. Ambrose was aged 26 at the time of his murder. The Hardy family were devastated by the conflict with their eldest brother John, who officially identified Ambrose's body, later being murdered by loyalists in his Ashton Street home in 1979. 50 years on from what became known as the New Lodge 6 massacre, we come together as a proud and defiant community as we remember Jim McCann, Jim Sloan, Tony T.C. Campbell, John Lochran, Brendan Fat McGuire and Ambrose Hardy. We also pay tribute to the courage and selfless acts of those people wounded as they went to the aid of the dying, people like Charlie Carson. These young men were husbands, fathers, sons and brothers. After 50 years, the New Lodge Six family still campaigned for truth as to why six local men were killed and one wounded without warning or provocation. We as a community will stand with them until they receive what has been denied to them for 50 years. Friends, you're all very welcome here today as we gather in such large numbers to stand with the families and friends of Jim McCann Jim Sloan, Tony Campbell, Brendan McGuire, John Lochran and Ambrose Harding as we remember them tonight on the 50th anniversary of their murders by the British Army. And I also want to acknowledge the family of Charlie Carson who was injured that night. I am honoured to have been asked by the families in the New Lodge Memorial Committee to address you all and I want from the outset to pay tribute to the families of the deceased. Fifty years on, the days of the 3rd and 4th of February are imprinted in the psyche and the fabric of the proud New Lodge community. Time hasn't diluted the intent and impact of the killings by the forces of the British state on this community and the families that night. Six men murdered, others injured, so many lives ruined, so many families destroyed. We stand here tonight in an act of community solidarity and empowerment that the New Lodge Six families are still being denied truth 50 years on. We hold tight to our experience, to our memory of what happened, and we also create space for the experience, the hurt and the memory of others who suffered. We will never ever forget what was taken from the families and the pain inflicted on this community. And I want you to know that we will always stand with you in your campaign for truth and justice. The six men we are here to remember tonight came from this area, all sons of the New Lodge. Firing from the top of the high-rise flats and from the Antrim Road and Dunkern Gardens across Ellingham Street, the British Army killed those six men on this road. These unarmed men courageously rushed to each other's aid and on the New Lodge Road they tried in vain to save each other under a hail of British gunfire and they died together. The well-trained British soldiers under direct orders and using their night sights for the first time murdered unarmed and defenceless men and walked away with absolute impunity. Sadly, the New Lodge killings was neither the first nor the last time that the guns of the British Army were turned on this community. Danny O'Hagan was killed in July 1970. Michael Hayes was killed in October 1972 and Peter McBride was killed in September 1992. And it was not only the British Army who waged war in this community. In December 1971, 15 lives lost in the McGurk's Bar massacre with so many more injured. And when the British state weren't directly involved in killings, they were sending their proxies to do it for them. Whether that was into my home as I sat having dinner with my family and my father, or into far too many other homes, particularly in North Belfast. 
lives cut short, and families ruined. This all amounted to British state-sponsored murder. That's how the New Lodge community experienced British occupation. And what happened in the New Lodge that night followed the same copybook when the British Army's Parachute Regiment shot 11 civ civilians dead in Bala Murphy. Or the events in Derry in January 1972 when again that same British Ar Army Regiment murdered 14 people. In July that same year Another five people in Spring Hill were murdered by the British Army. Tonight, I pay tribute to all our families that have campaigned for truth and justice for their loved ones. <laughs> yeah, the British Prime Minister and the current British Secretary of State are trying to put British soldiers who killed Irish citizens above the law. The British government cannot continue to act in such a partisan fashion by covering up state killings. They were neither independent nor neutral. They were a conflict actor. And the current Westminster Legacy Bill is evidence that the British government have much, much more to hide and conceal and cover up from their dirty war here in Ireland. Being no doubt whatsoever what this piece of legislation is about. It's about amnesties for state forces. It's about denying investigations. It's about avoiding accountability and it's about cover-up. At its core, the Legacy Bill prioritises the demands of the British military above those of its victims. And the Bill in law would deny any family their legal right to an investigation in line with human rights law or an inquest or a public inquiry or the ability to pursue a civil action. It is a full frontal assault on the very basic legal process and the administration of justice. It will deny the New Lodge families their right to an inquest. And this is beyond cruel and callous. The Legacy Bill is unworkable. It will not deliver for victims or survivors and it is in breach of the Good Friday Agreement. And it is incompatible with international human rights obligations. But this is the price that the British government is prepared to pay to protect those in Downing Street. Those who know the true extent of state murder because it was they and their predecessors who planned it. These are the actions of a rogue state who fear the truth that basic legal process will deliver for families. And that is their very clear intention. That's why that explanation is so simple. Because the British government intent is to protect both those, whether in uniform or in suits, who were involved in the murder of Irish citizens. Those in the political echelons in Downing Street and Whitehall know what is coming down the line and they are doing all they can to block the truth. They fear families, they fear the families sitting in front of me right now because they speak truth to power. They fear the families who seek truth and justice. So again, to Rishi Sunak, I say that neither we nor the families will accept the denial of our most basic legal rights and that this flawed legacy legislation should be withdrawn without further delay. For years, the British government used every resource they had, including the, the, the media or the ability to break the law or change the law, all to prevent the truth emerging. But that is an incredibly difficult thing to do, to prevent and to deny truth. You can try, but ultimately you will only be successful in delaying the truth, not in denying it. And the British government, make no mistake, know this. They know this when they see the strength of the families here today, remembering their loved ones 50 years after they were killed. They see the determination they have, and make no mistake about it, they fear it. Because they know you do not stand alone, that you will never stand alone. That is the strength that we have when we stand together. A success for one family is a success for us all. And a challenge or an obstacle to one family is a challenge to us all. Every single success a family has had in exposing the role of the British state here in fighting for truth and justice has come about in spite of, never because of, the actions of the British government. So we should not be surprised when they use crude methods to cover up their role but they will ultimately not be successful. And the reason for this is very simple. It's because of families like the New Lodge Six, who we are here commemorating and remembering tonight, and many, many others. 
So as we leave tonight, we carry the names of Jim McCann, Jim Sloan, Tony Campbell, Brendan McGuire, John Lockhart, and Ambrose Harding. We carry their names with us. And we say to the families that we will always stand with you until truth and justice has been achieved. We are not giving up. Go to meet them,